thank you, uh, Bridget and Brian, for that song, Be Thou My Vision. Okay. Um, it's uh, good to be uh, in God's house on uh, this uh, Sabbath. And uh, thank you for uh, the scripture reading, uh, Kim. But for now, let us go to uh, the book of uh, James, and uh, I'll read uh, a familiar text there. Uh, I'll read uh, James 1, verse 22. James 1, verse 22 says, uh, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Let us uh, consider for the next few moments the subject uh, with the title, The Good Soil. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we uh, thank you for your love. We thank you for allowing us to uh, come here one more time. And thank you for this opportunity that you have given us uh, to read from your word. We uh, invite uh, the Holy Spirit to come and uh, make uh, everything uh, plain to us. I also pray that uh, you may uh, perform the miracle of grace and allow a sinless message to be conveyed by a sinful human being. May we see Jesus this morning and be drawn closer to him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Oh, uh, continue our journey in uh, the book of uh, Matthew. The last time uh, I was here, we went over Matthew chapter 12. And uh, in Matthew chapter 12, we uh, saw that uh, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And we saw Jesus uh, correcting the Pharisees in how they were supposed to uh, observe the Sabbath. And uh, we saw Jesus uh, healing um, the uh, man who was uh, uh, who needed some healing on the Sabbath. And then uh, in that same chapter, Jesus told us that uh, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And uh, we also learned about uh, the unpardonable sin. Sinning against the Holy Spirit is uh, the sin, the unpardonable uh, sin. And then um, the Pharisees and the scribes were asking for a sign from Jesus. And uh, Jesus responded by saying uh, he will not perform any sign. The only sign that we have will be uh, uh, the sign of Jonah. And then the chapter ended with uh, Jesus clarifying who who uh, his uh, mother and brothers are. Right, so today we we'll, uh, get into uh, chapter 13. And uh, as we get into chapter 13, these are some of, these are the uh, main points that we find uh, in this chapter. The first uh, theme that we see here is uh, the parable of the sower. And as we go through this, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what type of soil are you? And then uh, Jesus tells the parable of uh, the wheat and tares, or the wheat and the weeds. Jesus says, let them grow together. And then um, he talks about uh, the uh, parable of the mustard seed signifying how the kingdom will uh, grow. And then uh, he also talks about uh, the parable of uh, the uh, hidden treasure uh, that uh, somebody sells everything that they have so that they may obtain it. There is another parable which is unique in Matthew, the, which is the parable of uh, the uh, uh, fishing net. Um, and then the chapter ends on a sad note with uh, uh, Jesus' own people taking on offense in what he said. 
they were rejecting his teachings. And uh, as we end on that, it will be my prayer that uh, it will be uh, that that experience will not be so for any of us. So let's uh, get into this uh, chapter. It begins with verse 1 by saying, That same day Jesus went out of uh, the house and sat by the lake. Such loud crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. So we have this uh, picture that uh, Matthew is uh, drawing for us. Jesus is uh, getting into this boat, and uh, he begins to uh, teach, or he begins to uh, tell uh, uh, his followers these parables while he's sitting uh, in a boat. And uh, as was uh, the custom, the, 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 the large crowd was gathering around him, right? And uh, in that crowd, there were some people who were coming with uh, their sick people waiting for Jesus to heal them, right? So, and Jesus gets into the boat. He told them many things in parable. And uh, the first one that he says is uh, the parable of a farmer who went out to sow his seed. This is uh, a familiar parable. We all know it as uh, the parable of the sower. But as familiar and as simple as it is, the servant of God says, because of its simplicity, the parable of the sower has not been valued as it should be. And uh, it is my prayer that uh, we find value in this parable, in these words that uh, Jesus uh, spoke. So he says, uh, a, went out, a farmer went out to sow as he was scattering seed. Some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on a rocky place, on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Then Jesus says in verse 9, whoever has ears, let him hear. So at the beginning of this chapter, we have this parable of the soul. And what we can conclude from this is Christ, is the fact that Christ is the soul. In the book, Our Christ Object Lessons, we are told that Christ's mission was not understood by the, people or by the people of his time. The manner of his coming was not in accordance with their expectation. So Christ comes the first time, and he is the soul. The people who lived during that time did not understand his mission. They did not understand what he was coming to do. Here we are, living just before Jesus comes again. The question is, do we fully comprehend the words of Christ or the mission of Christ? Do we fully understand what Jesus' mission for all nations is? He that soweth the good seed is the son of man, as we'll see in uh, Matthew 13, verse 37. Christ had come not as a king, but as a sower. Not for the overthrow of the kingdoms, 
but for scattering for the scattering of seed not to point his followers to earthly triumphs and national greatness but to a harvest to be gathered after patient toil and through losses and disappointment that was the purpose of christ he came to sow the good seed so christ is the sower christ went out to sow we are also told in Christ's object lesson on page 36 that so Christ, the heavenly sower, went forth to sow. He left his home of security and peace, left the glory that he had with the Father before the world was, he left his position upon the throne of the universe. Christ went forth a suffering tempted men went forth in solitude to sow in tears to water his with his blood the seed of life for a world lost so he left heaven where angels bowed before him where holy angels fell and worshiped him he left all of that so that he could come to this earth to sow the seed. And the question that uh, the expectation that Christ has for you is he expects you to be a co-laborer with him. He left heaven so that he could come and reach out to us but he expects you to be a fellow sower with him. We are told uh, on page 36 again that his servants, now she's talking about you and I, his servants in like manner must go forth to sow. We saw Christ coming to uh, uh, plant, he expects you to do the same thing. So those who are called to unite with Christ must leave all in order to follow him. We have uh, examples from uh, scripture of people like Abraham who was called to leave the familiar and go to a place that God was, uh, was uh, calling him to and he obeyed. How is it going to be for you and I? You and I have been called to go and be sowers just like Christ, are we going to be faithful to this call? Are we going to leave old associations? It says old associations must be broken up. Plans of life relinquished. Earthly hopes surrendered. In toil and tears, in solitude, and through, through sacrifice must the seed be sown are you a faithful soul are you planting the seed where you are are you planting the seed in your home are you planting the seed at your workplace are you planting the seed in your neighborhood you and i are supposed to be sowing the seed following christ's example we have a message to share with the world we have to plant the seed. Wherever we are, we may not be called to go to Africa as missionaries or to a foreign land, but you and I have a responsibility. Where we are, are you going to be faithful? Will you go and plant the seed? In this... Uh, first parable Christ talks about uh, planting the seed and notice he is uh, the master sower we follow after him and the word of God is the seed the only thing that's different in this parable is the type of soil where this seed is planted 
the same sower, the same plant, the same seed, but different type of soil. The first soil that we see in here is, uh, we are told that some seed fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. So as the word of God goes out, the first seed fell by the path. So as the word of God goes out, we hear the word of God in different situations. Sabbath school, sermon, it, uh, you may even hear it uh, on audio, you may hear it on the radio, on the internet. As you hear the word of God, this type of soil went to the path where people step on. And as the word fell on the path, the birds of the air came and they ate that seed such that it did not even have room to grow. It is my prayer, my brothers and my sisters, that we are not this type of soil. That as we hear the word of God, by the time that we leave this house, may we not allow the devil to come and snatch what God is trying to teach us, what the word of God is telling us to do. So the first type of soil does not allow the word of God to change it. It does not even allow the word of God to germinate or to grow. What type of soil are you? Are you the type of soil that will allow the seed, of, uh, the, the seed to grow? The second type of soil uh, is uh, the uh, rocky place. It says uh, some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. They withered because they had no root. So it seems to be a progression. Now the seed falls on this rocky place. It germinated, it sprang up, but there is no room for the roots to go deeper. This signifies the people who hear the word of God. They believe it. They begin to act on it. But for some reason, they don't allow the word of God to go deeper in their lives. And the unfortunate is because there is no room to grow, this, uh, the seed withered. The seed dies. It does not go anywhere. And the seed is the word of God. Do we allow the word of God to grow in our lives? Or do we choke it with our, our, our different stuff? Uh, which leads us to the um, next uh, type of soil, which is um, thorny soil. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, right? So the seed fell on this type of soil. It germinated and it began to grow. You hear the word of God. You believe it. You want to act on it. But this type of soil does not allow the word of God to grow. Why? Because there are outside factors, pleasures, the things of this world that choke the word of God and prohibit it from growing. What type of soil are you? And living as we are in this day and age, we have so many things that can distract the word of God. And, you know, I believe in technology. We use it. I'm using it right here. But if we are not careful, that can also get into the way of God to choke the word of God. We live convinced about the word of God. But somehow, other things take precedence. May we not allow anything, the things of this world, the technology, these gadgets, may we not allow them to choke the word of God. But thank God 
for this type of soil, for the good soil, Jesus said, still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, and thirty times what was sown. The word of God was sown, the third, the third type of soil, it was it fell on good ground. This represents somebody who hears the word of God, believes the word of God, acts on the word of God, and you know what happens? The seed grows. It produces fruit. God expects fruit from us. A hundredfold, thirtyfold, is there fruit in our lives. When we hear the word of God, does it change us? Does it grow us? We, 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 we hear of our Bible studies that are taking place at five every Sabbath. That's exactly what God expects from all of us. To grow, to share the word of God with others. That's an indication of good soil which is growing and producing some fruit. Are you producing some fruit? As we hear the word of God, we just don't hear it so that we can keep it to ourselves. It's supposed to grow. It's supposed to produce some fruit in our lives. It is my prayer, my brothers and my sisters, that we are the good soil. The good soil that allows the word of God to grow and produce some seed. So that's the uh, uh, first parable that we see uh, in this chapter. Jesus continues in verse 24 with another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared, right? So here we have somebody who has good intentions, good farmer, plants wheat, but as he leaves, the enemy comes, plants the weeds. And now we have this situation where we have the good seed, the wheat is growing, and the tears are also growing. And then the owner servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? That would uh, seem logic, right? For the servants to go and pull out the weeds, pull up the weeds. But verse 29 gives us some warning. No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. We as the servants do not have the responsibility to remove the uh, tears. We don't have the responsibility to remove the weeds. Jesus is saying, let them grow together. That's not your responsibility. I will take care of it. Our responsibility is not to go and uproot any weeds. Writing on this, uh, the servant of God says, Christ has plainly taught that those who persist in open sin must be separated from the church. So Christ taught that. But he has not committed us to the work of judging character and motive. That's not our place. To judge anybody's character and motive. He knows our nature too well to entrust this work to us. Amen. God knows me. He knows you. We are not good at character judgment. So he says, leave that to me. That's not your responsibility. The tares and the wheat are to grow to, together until the harvest. 
and the harvest is the end of probationary time. So Christ says, let it grow together. Don't take it upon yourself to clean up the church. God knows that stuff like that happens. My responsibility is to clean up my character, not to worry about the next person. She goes on to say, there is in this, in the Savior's words, another lesson. A lesson of wonderful forbearance and tender love. Amen. Christ, in his love, he could have uprooted the weeds, but he is forbearing. His tender love will not allow them, allow him to remove those weeds. Maybe they might change and be converted. What may appear to you as weeds, the Holy Spirit may be working on them, trying to change them. And you know what? Christ is he's providing sunshine for the wheat. He's providing sunshine for the tares. He's providing rain for the weeds. He's providing rain for the tares. He is not selective in his providence. He is not providing oxygen to people in good and regular standing. He is providing oxygen to everyone. And maybe those people might repent at some point. So that's the other lesson that we can see in this. And let's not forget, as we look at all of this, our responsibility is not to clean up the church. Let's move on to um, another parable. In verse 31 of Matthew 13, he, say, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seed, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. Remember in this audience, we have uh, Pharisees who in the last chapter, they were asking for a sign. They did not fully believe that Jesus was the Messiah because they are expecting somebody who is powerful, somebody who is rich, somebody who has influence to come. So they can't make sense out of what Christ is doing. And Christ is reading their minds because they expect someone powerful to come and change the world. And Jesus, in saying this parable, he is reading their minds. He knows where they are coming from. So he is telling them, that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds. The kingdom of God does not have to begin in a grandiose way, in a powerful way. It can be, it will begin as the smallest of all seeds. Jesus is reminding the Pharisees that he doesn't have, his kingdom is different from the, kingdom of, the kingdoms of this world, where the standards of this world, I, 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 I know uh, this is uh, an election year. One of the things that I have noticed, have you noticed that anybody who has, who seriously runs to be the president of the United States is already a millionaire. It doesn't matter which political party they belong to. By the time they become a presidential nominee of their part, they are all millionaires. You don't get an ordinary person who is not a millionaire who makes it to be a presidential nominee of any major party in this country. They are rich and powerful people who have made it in this life financially. Not so with Jesus. He is not part of the rich and powerful. His kingdom is starting on humble beginnings and yet the outcomes are going to be powerful. Amen. 
the small mustard seed, the smallest of all plants, and yet it will grow to be more than 10 feet. No one here is, uh, uh, we have Rab, who's uh, the tallest, I think, uh, in here. You are not even as tall of, uh, as a mustard seed. That small seed, it becomes bigger. And that's the lesson that Jesus is teaching here. You don't have to be among the rich and powerful as long as you have the word of God. The word of God is powerful. So the standards that this world has are totally different from the standards that God has for us, for you and me. And I'm glad for that. So that's the uh, parable of uh, the uh, uh, mustard seed. And he also um, talks about uh, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the door. Writing on these two parables, the servant of God says, and in this last generation, the parable of the mustard seed is to reach a signal of triumphant fulfillment. The little seed will become a tree. The last message of warning and mercy is to go to every nation and kindred and tongue to take out um, of them a people for his name and the earth shall be lightened with his glory. That's the power of the word of God. That's the power of what we have, of um, what we represent when we take this uh, word out there. Uh, she goes on to say that uh, as uh, the living, when mingled with the meal, works from within outward, so it is by the renewing of the heart that the grace of God works to transform the life. There is, we, we have uh, some situations where living has been uh, used as a bad thing, right? So at some, in some verses, Jesus is saying, be careful of the living of the Pharisees, right? But in here, he's using it for the good. He's using it as something that is good. That's an ingredient that changes door. When it's put in that door, the simple door grows and becomes bigger. There is an agent. It's, it, 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 it's used as an agent that can change. I want to have that in my life. Amen. When we have this agent, which can represent the spirit of God or the power of the grace of God, it can transform simple things, ordinary things, and make them into something great. Live and changes the bread and makes it something bigger. I want to have that in my life. You don't have to be, as I mentioned earlier, part of the millionaire club. All you need is the power of God in your life. As long as you have that, you can make a difference in this, in this life. You can make a difference more than the millionaires as long as you allow God to work wonders in your life. That's what Jesus is saying in these two parables of the mustard seed and uh, the uh, uh, living. The next parable, or the next parables, in uh, verse 44 and 45, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and brought that field. So Jesus is talking to the uh, Pharisees. He's talking to the crowd. During this time, people did not uh, take their investments to the ground. right? It was common for people to take their investments, whether it was uh, gold, um, silver, they would bury it under the ground. And in some situations, somebody would die without disclosing where they buried their treasures, right? So they would leave 
everything buried in the ground. That's the way they saved their money. Right? We, 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 we have situations where sometimes banks have this unclaimed property. Maybe somebody dies without uh, a will and without assigning their money to somebody else. Right? And in our day, I think the state takes over those funds. So Jesus is talking to people who did not put their investments in banks. They put it under the ground. So imagine, good son, you are working out in the fields, which you probably don't do anymore. And as you are working, you run into this treasure. It's not your field. So you cannot claim it. What you'd do then is you'd bury it, go and sell everything that you have. And people will look at you as if you are crazy. Why is he doing that? You sell everything that you have so that you can purchase that field. And as you purchase the field, that whole gold becomes yours. So Jesus is saying that's how it should be when it comes to the treasure that we find in his word. We should seek it with everything that we have. We should value the treasure that we have in the word of God. In Sabbath school, we were learning of people who saw the value in the treasure, in the treasure uh, uh, that is uh, uh, in here. And they were willing to give their lives, to sacrifice everything for this treasure. Are we willing to do that? Do we see the word of God as truly as a treasure? Or do we look at it casually? It is transforming power. Speaking of this treasure, I'll read uh, uh, straight from our Sabbath school lesson. It says, uh, it was the Bible that made him what he was, speaking of uh, uh, John Wycliffe. The effort to grasp the great truths of revelation imparts freshness and vigor to all faculties. He realized that as it comes to the word of God. It expands Listen to this. The word of God expands the mind, sharpens the perceptions, and ripens judgment. We are talking about the treasure of the word of God. Amen. The study of the Bible will ennoble every thought. You want to be the greatest attorney, Kim? Study this treasure. It enables every thought, feeling, and aspiration as no other study can. It gives stability of purpose, patience, courage, and fortitude. It refines the character and sanctifies the soul. That's what the word of God can do. It is a treasure. This parable of the hidden treasure illustrates the value of the heavenly treasure and the effort that should be made to secure it. What efforts are we, are we making? To secure the treasures uh, of the word of God. The finder of the treasure in the field was ready to part with all that he had, ready to put forth untiring labor in order to secure the hidden riches. You tell me that you can sacrifice and work a shift so that you can make a few dollars? Here we have something much more valuable than those uh, dollars. So the find of heavenly treasure will count no labor too great and no sacrifice too dear in order to gain the treasures of truth. And then the other parable of uh, the pearl, Christ himself is the pearl of great price. In him is gathered all the glory of the Father, the fullness of the Godhead. May we go on this journey to seek Christ as the pearl of great value. May that be what consumes our days as we seek to learn more of God. The uh, next parable that we see uh, in here which is uh, actually the last parable, is the parable for the drag net. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. 
And this is another parable which is uh, unique to Matthew. Only Matthew records it. Similar, uh, illust similar um, application as uh, the one with uh, the wheat and tares. Jesus is saying that dragnet draws everything. I'm not sure um, if anybody here has ever had any experience with um, fishing by nets. But I remember as a young boy um, going to the river where I grew up, where we would use nets. They were not allowed, right? And uh, it was uh, we, we, we to do it uh, against uh, the laws, you know, and uh, we had to uh, hide away from uh, the uh, those who were responsible. And the reason why they did not allow them, actually in our case, we did not quite use nets, would use a sex, mm -hmm. right? And what it would do is you would catch everything, the fish, the crabs, the frogs, everything from the, from the river, you'd catch it, right? So you, you, get every, you, you get everything, you take the net to the land, you get what you want, and typically would not put the other stuff back in, right? So Jesus is saying the kingdom of uh, heaven is like a net that is thrown out. It catches everything, all kinds of fish. And it's not our responsibility to sort the fish. God has that responsibility. Let's not take our, uh, upon ourselves to do the screening. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up to shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bed away. This is how it will be at the end of the ages. The casting of the net is the preaching of the gospel. So you and I have the responsibility to preach the gospel, which gathers both the good and the evil into the church. Let them all come in. When the mission of the gospel is completed, the judgment will accomplish the work of separation. Let's not be consumed with the work of separation. That's not our responsibility. Therefore, Christ lifts the veil from the future and bids all to behold that it is the character, not position, which decides destiny. The position in church, it doesn't matter. It does not de determine our destiny. Our destiny is determined by our character. And may God help us so that we may be consumed with the responsibility of changing our characters into the character of Christ so that when he comes, we will be the good fish. The last part of the chapter, Jesus says, the Bible says, when Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue. So he left that shore, goes to his own hometown, and when he goes to his hometown, verse 57 says something that is disturbing. They took offense on him. His own people took offense at him. How, is, how will it be with you and me? When we hear the words of God, do we accept it? Or do we take offense at what Christ says? And is it not said that Christ came unto his own and his own received him not? The light of God shone into the darkness of the world and the darkness comprehended it not. How will it end with us? As we hear these parables, as we hear the word of God, do we allow, us, allow it to change us? It is my prayer, my brothers and my sisters, that we are not like Christ, the people from the hometown of Christ who rejected him, who, take off, who took offense in what Jesus did. And by doing that, they were not the good soil. I want to be the good soil. Amen. I want to be the person who hears the word of God and not only hear it, but becomes a doer of the word of God as James call, calls us to do. May God help us so that all of us become good soil Amen. and become hearers, not just hearers of the word, but hearers and doers. May God bless you.